it's interesting how powerful design is. We're lucky as Americans, we have this great example that we can point to, and we just point to Apple Computer. It's like the most valuable company in the history of corporations, and it's a design-driven company. Before, people used to think design was this adjunct thing that you add to something, you know. It's, it's something that you do after the strategy is done. Well, it isn't. Design is the strategy. I'm sort of proud to be an American designer. I was brought up in the Bay Area. I'm very much a California product. The funny thing is my grandfather was a baker and my father was a butcher, so I apparently I was supposed to be a candlestick maker, but there was no uh, art or design at all in our background. They were a hardworking, you know, blue-collar family. When I was in college, what I admired were like Massimo Vignelli, his office, and uh, of course the Eames. To me, it was always sort of this eclectic mix of celebrating what is American and also the reserve and that spirit of modernism. And so I went into graphic design. That was my major, it was communication design. I come from a point of view that everything communicates, whether it's a space or an object or a chair, or, you know, or graphics. And so that's why when I design things, it maybe is a little bit different than, than someone who's solely an architect or uh, industrial designer. So now zoom way in on it. Cool, looks good. You want to show people that you get it and that you get them. And uh, you know, I've been fortunate. I have a lot of clients who've actually allowed me to break down barriers and do other types of projects and bring my design sensibility to that, that, these other disciplines. If I can control, one, the brand, what it looks like, if I can help them develop that, if I can then do what the advertising would be of that brand, and then if I can control the space that that brand is sold in, and then the real trifecta, though we're on four, would be as if I can design some of the product. When I worked with Esprit, we did the bed and bath division. So we designed all the product, we designed all the showrooms, all the advertising. It's this process where I try to look at who they're selling their products to and who they are as a culture. And I try to make it so that the message is as honest as it can be. One of the clients I've worked with for a long time is Technion. I remember the very first <laughs> presentation I did. We basically wanted to talk about the future because, you know, that was, the th you know, everybody wants to know what the future is going to be. And, and so in my conversation with them, I said, you know, no one really knows what the future is. And so we came up with this image, which was a rocket man. So it was a 1950s guy putting on his tie and all that stuff, but he had a rocket pack on his back. And our headline was, what will the day after tomorrow look like? And our whole thing was the day after tomorrow will look a lot like today, but with some slight differences. And that's what launched Technion sort of on this new direction that they've been on. Wow, this showroom is Amazing. Thank you. This space is typical of my sort of concept I have about retail design, where you're not supposed to be able to see everything at once. So as you come in, you get one layer when, when you're met. And then into the space, you get into another layer. And then we created this hallway so that it separates the other area in the back where the sort of uh, wall product and other types of furniture are shown. But you look up into the city, which is a great view. It's stunning. Another uh, really great client, which I have many of, is uh, Janice Feldman of Janice at Sea. For the Los Angeles showroom, we wanted to have a hedge that we could grow indoors, and she informed me, Michael, you can't do that. And I said, well, it's Hollywood, there must be, and she says, good idea, let me work on this. And now it's a product of hers, and it's an amazing little grid system that actually all nails together these little squares. There's multi-colors. The yeah, case. and it looked like the real thing. Yeah. We moved to the wine country, my beautiful wife and I. We built this about 10 years ago, and uh, it was a small little house that existed here, pretty run down, and so we basically knocked it down and made another two-bedroom house that's a little bit bigger. This is unbelievable. This is our weekend home, but we're still considered locals by the locals. And so over time, I've actually picked up clients. I was doing work for the Vintners Association, and then I started picking up wineries, 
And there's, that's a great client to have because you can get drunk while you're working. So this is Scarecrow. And oh, this is the label we actually cute. signed the first bottling. But stylistically, that's pretty much what I do. I try to make them very minimal. Say goodbye, wine. <laughs> What's been interesting is I've been able to sort of inject my, uh, my sort of philosophy of design of paring things down, making them elegant, making them beautiful and memorable. And, and, and it's worked really well. Typography is the vessel of the written word, right? So nothing can be more important than type, the way it's done. Is there anything that you think about with the space between, you know? Like understanding the space between right. letters. Right, I mean, kerning, that's the term for the space in between letters, is a real art. You know, I remember when I was in school, I had an old German professor, and his was like, you have to think of it as though there's sand between each one, and there should be the same amount of sand between each letter, so that even though it forms around the letter forms, it's, it, it, it all balances. I was hired to do a, a retail store on Madison Avenue for the Robert Talbot Company, the men's furnishings. And this is where the shirts would go. And so. What was so funny, I assumed that she knew that we did branding and graphic design. And when we were doing the model of the retail store, I was saying to Peter and my wife, I said, you know what, on the awning, I'm just going to re, kind of fix this up. And as we're finishing the meeting, she says, gee, I really like the way our name looks on the awning. And she says, do you know anybody who could actually do our letterhead and use this on it? And I said, well, actually, I, I could do that. <laughs> and so that's how my career has gone in a strange way, right? Furniture, opportunity, take advantage. Interior architecture, opportunity, take advantage. It's not a job, it's a lifestyle. You know? right. It's like I always tell my students, you, you know you're a designer when you can't possibly walk down the street without making a value judgment about everything you see. My alma mater is the college where I teach now, California College of the Arts. I'm the dean of design. You know, CCA is a great uh, institution because the, the blurring of what architecture, industrial design, fashion, graphic design, it's like this great soup of, of sort of disciplines all coming together. Don't be so linear about, I'm a graphic designer and I do graphics. It's like, don't think about it that way. I'm teaching still these almost 40 years because of the students. Students to me are an inspiration. I feel it's important in design to give back. And uh, for me, it's made me a better designer, I think. I mean, the idea in design of being who you are, and, 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 and you know, that sounds corny, but you need to find the things that are really unique about who you are and companies and people, and that you, without a doubt, can support and defend what that is. And those are the things that you raise up and you look at and you position them in a place where they speak for you. Hi everybody, it's Cindy and we are back with none other than Michael Vanderbile and we're going to check in with him and he's in Napa right now. Hi Michael. Hey there Cindy, good to see you. So nice to see you too. Boy, we had a good time all those years ago doing that um, video, huh? I know, I was a little younger then I think. But, uh... I was a little younger then too. <laughs> That's grayer. okay. A little grayer. Yeah. You look you, though, you look exactly the same. No, you look you look fantastic. So, um, so first, tell me how are things out there? Things are things are strange, like they are everywhere. But uh, being up here in Saint Helena, you know, we're already socially distanced anyway because it's all vineyards and whatnot. And uh, we've been up here. Alicia and I have been here since. Uh, geez, we closed the office. Uh, I think. March 10th or something like that. So we've been here for a very long time. I'm actually wearing clothes for you. <laughs> At least uh, the top. At least the top. Well, well, bottoms are on too. I, I, even <laughs> shoes. It's crazy. But uh, but we're doing well in my office. We've been actually working remotely. And in fact, the, the first couple of weeks were sort of strange. I was actually getting a lot more done, which made me worry. <laughs> you yeah, know? You worry. Wait, I have to tell everybody that um, this great story, you just reminded me of um, you know, so I, you know, I'm ed editing a magazine, but I'm like very close to working on the layouts and all the art and, um, and Michael too, because he's a brilliant graphic designer. So when we were shooting that documentary, do you remember this, Michael? Do you remember this? 
Yeah, so we were shooting this documentary. I said, I want to see how you work. And so he sat in the chair and he sat next to one of his designers and then he scooted over in the chair and sat next to the other. And I was like, that's exactly what I do too. Riding shotgun, we call it, you know? Ah, riding shotgun, yes. Yeah. So we're not doing that right now. Everything, no. you know, the remote thing is, is really tricky when you're working on that yeah. kind of detail. Yeah, and what, and what I've been doing, which is, you know, thank God for technology. So what will happen is we'll have a discussion and then what I'll do is I'll do a sketch, the old school way, photograph it on my phone and then email it to them. And then we sort of talk about the sketch from there and then they do some revisions, send it back to me. And it's actually worked out quite well. Because what happens when I'm, when I'm writing shotgun in the office, I've discovered is that I get distracted too much. Like we'll be in the middle of getting something done and then something else will come up. Oh yeah, that happens all the time. But I always think like somehow managing all those things is, productive but it's like what's tricky on my end is that like the normal back and forth becomes like instead of it being organic and actually pretty quick it becomes yeah. like a step back and forth and back and yeah. forth right. and that's where people could you know normally it's just part of the process right right well what, what i find is i end up having to write copious notes on the sketch right to make sure they understand what it is right. yeah and uh they get it nine times out of 10. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a really different way of working. I think we're all gonna be a lot better at this when we, at communicating when we get back because I, we were waiting for so long, you know? I agree. So you were telling me, um, you were telling about the students because you've been, you were the Dean of the School of Design at California College of Arts and Arts and Crafts, right? It used to be, it's the California College of the Arts. Yeah. Of the Arts yeah. for yeah. how many years? For decades, right? Thirty two years, something like that. And I, I stepped away just a, a couple of years ago, but I still so very tight with the faculty and, and I, the class I created, which was the thesis, senior thesis graphic design class. Uh, you know, they dragged me back to the group crits for midterms. And I, in fact, I just finished uh, a midterm right as all this started. And, and, I, and I think back to it and it was like, you know, you have, 25 students all sitting in the back. You've got a row of faculty and guests like myself talking and all you're hearing is coughing and sneezing behind. And then after it was all over, like, that was probably not the smartest thing I've ever done once this, this uh, sort of pandemic moved on, but everybody was fine. And now what they're doing is that it'll be the first time in this class that I develop that the senior thesis is usually this really uh, huge event. I mean, because uh, it's a public, Crit. Yeah. I always feel sorry for the students because probably literally about 70 to 100 people show up while you talk about your project, right? And so this will be the first time that they're actually going to do one on one with their faculty and they'll do it on, on Zoom and that'll, that'll be it. It's, it's so sad because it's so anticlimactic because it's your final, you know, yeah, whole gate you go through to move into the profession. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, I feel sorry for the students because they're not going to get all of that great interchange. So. Right, right. Well, you've done so much for so many students. It's really amazing. I love that they keep pulling you back in. Come on, Michael. Yeah, one more time. But the, yeah. the, the good thing I like is that when I used to have to try and corral outside professionals to come to the crit, you know, it would last from nine in the morning till six at night and they'd leave at like 1.30, right? And so now I can do that to them. I can leave, right? right? We have the poor professors to do do the rest of the work, but well, you know, one thing that we that we see a lot now, and um, uh, communication in different ways is so important. But graphics and communications and all of this messaging around COVID is really making an impact. And I know you were even telling me about a project um, yeah. that you were going to share. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting. I have this great developer client in the East Bay. Uh, Sunset Development Bishop Ranch, and they have a very large 84 acre, you know, uh, business park where Chevron and uh, PG&E and a lot of major Toyota, a lot of major corporations are there. And uh, so I get a call from my client, Alex Moran, who's, by the way, I always love telling this story. He's the grand, great grandson of Thomas Watson of IBM. So this guy has got good design lineage. He's, you know. Yeah, he it's in his blood, right? Blood. 
And so he says, Michael, I have an aunt, and this is before all the COVID thing had really started to push, right? Mm -hmm. He says, you know, I really want to have you design some icons and uh, pictograms to sort of help us alert all of our tenants in this large project how to protect themselves and how to protect others and that sort of thing. So we did a whole little series of, and the ones I'll show were just the ones we had photographed. We did many more. And they were all implemented, but they were all sort of on brand, which I think right. maybe isn't the most necessary thing to do, but that's how he is about detail. He wants everything to seem as though it's been touched and been thoughtfully uh, presented to, to his tenants. They take great care of their tenants. I love that. So what, what are some of the ones that we'll see? Like, what do they you know, say? It's, or it's the ones that everybody else says, like washing your hands and, uh, you know, uh, social distancing, which was the odd one, because I decided to use a figure. And so I have two people like facing each other with a dotted line down in the middle. Right? That's know? so cute, yeah. And one guy with his mouth wide open, right? So anyway, it was, it's sort of, it was a really interesting thing, but it, it was sort of funny because it really literally was the last thing we did before on that Friday. And then like the following week is when everything started to, to break loose and, uh, and they implemented them and they use them in email blasts and that type of stuff. But they, Thank goodness. You know, that's yeah. wonderful though that you, that, I mean, wonderful. It's not wonderful that any of this is going on, but that's sort of like kismet in a way, right? Well, and it's, and it's to me, it shows how thoughtful the client is, you know, instead yeah. of just grabbing random weird low, you know, designs from all over. Right. He wanted right. them to make sure that they were authored by them. For right, his, exactly. The, to show what the design heritage of, of this uh, client is, they just finished a building designed by Renzo Piano, which is a shopping complex, basically. I think it's his first shopping center in a, you know, ever in America. And it's a, it's a gorgeous, beautiful building, uh, anodized aluminum ribbed, horizontal ribbed building. And, uh, and I wanted, when I worked with the client on the branding of it, I said, you know, Renzo has designed these great banners that he wants up. But I said, the worst thing you could ever do on this incredibly beautiful building would be to put a bunch of advertising for, you know, restaurants or something that's in yeah. there. So I said, you know, I'm from the East Bay. I was born in the East Bay, Oakland. And uh, I, maybe, maybe it's not known, you know, all over the country, but uh, we're, Oakland's like the Chicago to New York. You know, it's like, it's yeah. never... <laughs> It's never as good as San Francisco. And so I went to my client and I said, you know, you've done this amazing, beautiful building. And I said, to honor it, we should also honor the East Bay. So we, we turned the banners into cultural banners. And so they celebrate East Bay uh, artists, designers, innovators, that type of thing. And the first ones were uh, uh, like uh, all paintings like Deben Corn you know, uh, Joan Brown, all artists who worked in the East Bay and celebrated them. And it was just, you know, City Center celebrates the artists of the East Bay. And we're going to do that with athletes. We were working on one for athletes for the Olympics, but unfortunately they got canceled. So, but that's the type of client he is. So this building and, and uh, the images you'll see are, are just gorgeous. They're just giant paintings, no commercial message, nothing. Uh, Love it. A photograph of the artist, you know, wow. so you get the context. So you're going shopping to your, uh, you know, pottery barn, and there is like an amazing piece of art above your head that is almost uh, three stories high. So, Honoring design and the arts, right? Exactly. Not being yeah. apologetic about it, which is no, fantastic. No. Honoring it yeah. and being proud of the East Bay, which I think is great. So I love that. That's so great. Yeah. Okay, so then, and you have such an eclectic array of clients. Um, yeah. The one I always like to tell is one thing Michael definitely likes to do is drink wine. Um, <laughs> in fact, he's got, you've got a small building in the back of your yard. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yeah, you have like it's, a little wine house or something. And it's getting a little more empty now that this, uh, you know, we've been here for so long drinking. But you've done some beautiful, you've done some beautiful labels. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us about them. Well, you know, I think it even says in the video that, I, you know, the great thing about a wine client is that you get to drink while you're working. And uh, so, you know, lately we've been working on actually rebranding some of David Feldberg's uh, uh, wines. I, I don't know, but most people probably do that David has a really amazing <clears throat> winery up in Niagara-on-the-Lake, which is 
It was the first lead certified winery in the world and uh, you know, just uh, a really great place. But David also- I gotta tell everybody, so David Felberg, amazing oh. guy, the head of Technion. CEO yeah. or I yeah. don't know what is he? What is David? He? David Feldberg is the owner of Technion. Owner, yeah. owner, the owner of Technion couldn't be nicer guy, and he has a winery. <laughs> exactly, which makes it double win, you know. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> so, uh, we have the best time together. <laughs> right, and and so what's great is that he also has a great sense of humor that a lot of people don't realize until you really get to know him. And in the beginning, we would name the wines. He was doing a very serious wine called Stratus. But there were other, uh, they call it juice. There was juice on the property that they wanted to sell, you know, because David's not going to throw anything away or give it away. He's going to, you know, be, be a good businessman. And so after our third bottle of wine at dinner one night, at second or third, we decided to call that wine wild ass. But we had a little bit of a issue that the Canadian Alcohol Board may not approve a name like that. So I designed the label and has a little cartouche of a jackass on it. So it's, you know, kind of goofy looking little jackass, but it's there. And so we're just, we just finished a project and I'll send you images of that too, uh, that he's now doing it a rosé, but they're doing it in cans because, you know, it's sort of the new, the new thing yeah, now. Okay. To, you know, yeah. Move away from the very traditional stuff. And I figure if you're called jackass, you can do whatever you want. Whatever you want. I have to say he he is such a wonderful besides have amazing company but he is such a wonderful guy and like you said so funny um, but you know I had Passover with you all one year many many That's years right. ago and he was thinking about that now and called me up yeah because yeah. it was Passover and he said oh I he, he remembered that we, we just had such a special time. That's what the great guy he is. Okay, what else are you doing? You're doing something else with Technion. Yeah, we're, uh, we're doing the Montreal showroom for him. Uh, we, uh, we did one quite a few years ago and now they're moving into another building. And so we're in the design phase and that's, that's good even during the slowdown, you know, the design process, uh, you know, is uh, way before he has to sp spend any big money. So, uh, yeah. It's uh, and then he'll be ready to hit the ground as soon as uh, as soon as things open up again. Yeah, and That's then great. we're also doing a, an interesting new branding book that started before all this, and we jokingly call it the Brick because it's going to be about we're going to go by weight. You know, it's, I love that. You love it, to do you love to do books that are big and books are the best thing. When, yeah, when, they're when, the best. When when people said print is dead, I said, oh, you have no idea. It's just yeah. beginning, you know? Yeah, exactly. Because people exactly. value books, you know? Yes, totally. So we're, so we're doing a new brand book that kind of uh, explains the design ethos of the company and, you know, the collaborations that they've done. And uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to include a lot of things that are just everything Technion, basically. So, and, and that's why I'm very excited because it's not going to be very big, small, but thick, you know? Thick, nice and thick. Right, yeah. right. And then what else? I think you said you were doing some furniture. Yeah, I um, I have a longtime client out of a residential client out of Los Angeles, A. Rudin, the nicest family. I I, I do uh, half my fee is design fee, the other is family counseling, because so, <laughs> they're a great family. But it's the two young sons are coming up, and you know, they're they're wanting to move the company a direction and dad's you know has mm. great information and history and so it's a matter of you know and they're i love them to pieces yeah, they, i know you they, do they, i know you do they literally, yeah. in fact the uh, ralph the father says that spencer is i'm his second father basically because anyway but the two boys are starting a division called evan spencer and it's going to be a younger more mm. Uh, progressive online presence furniture company and I've done uh, 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 and it's they're from Southern California so they wanted to kind of represent kind of that spirit of West Coast casual you know and we've heard all those words before but I think these boys have such a great young spirit about them and so it's going to be like a you know modern but warm familiar but challenging you know that kind of thing and they're they're really doing a great job and the the irony though is that they were just ready to launch in march when we've just done the showroom we uh the prototypes of my chair that i just did the stinson chair uh yeah. were complete it was all set in place and then the next week it had to be put on hold but you know we're still working on sort of 
uh, you know, sort of social media, email uh, blast, that kind of thing to just sort of get people ready so when it's over that this division can launch, so. Yeah, they, um, but at least the pieces are ready too, right? They're not stuff yeah, good to that's the up. Great thing. All the prototypes yeah. and, and the finished production stuff is ready to go so people can order it day one once it. Right, were they gonna show at Neocon or? They were going to show at Neocon. I'm actually redoing their uh, residential showroom at Neocon right now. Um, I think they're probably the only people who are gonna be able to construct anything in the building because everything stopped. But they, uh, their, their uh, new space is uh, near Janus and, and other, other clients on that floor. So uh, they were gonna do like a little pop-up there of, yeah. of Evan Spencer brand, so. They could do it with us. On, they, uh, they, on should. The they should. You got to yeah. talk to them about that. We're going to do two weeks with them. All. We're doing like a two week program. So there's stuff, there's, there's stuff to get it out there. Lots well, of different and, ways. and you know, the other thing you'll like is we, we just did the branding program, the whole photo shoot, and we're using all sort of LA, like a guy who shapes surfboards and, you know, a, a poster artist, you know, John Van Hemmerstald and all these people in the photograph of the of the the products and it's been great they they, they sort of want to celebrate like the la um inspirations to them so i'll make Love sure that. To those too oh that's so great yeah i want to see it all that's yeah. fantastic because you know there are certain um certain friends who are saying oh we didn't get our photo shoot in yet so i love when i hear that somebody did yeah, um they got it done <laughs> so yeah good. And so, how? So, as, as sort of a final, a final thought for the industry, um, what are you thinking about, just in terms of getting getting beyond this, and also us, you know, being together as a community? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I have great faith in human beings, and I think what this has done is it's made us appreciate people who do un you know, heralded jobs, Yeah. you know, grocery stores and, you know, people that deliver packages and things like that. Yes. Yeah. You know, and September 11th, it was really the first responders and absolutely, but we not only have that, we have, we, we understand how complicated we are as a culture and how interwoven we are and how much we rely on each other. Yes. And I think, I think people will be kinder. They may not shake your hand immediately, but I'm proposing that we take up the Japanese tradition of bowing instead. I think that shows great respect. But I love that. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think the design community. I don't believe we ever took anything for granted, but I know we will never take our clients for granted. We'll never take the responsibilities we have for granted. You know, and that that we do make a difference. You know, mm -hmm. just doing those little COVID symbols. You know make you feel like you were doing something right i mean absolutely uh, so design i think design will come out stronger i think we'll uh we're always pretty tight as a community but i think we're really going to be tight after this so because there are a lot of design firms that are you know luckily my firm's small enough and i'm going to knock on wood here that we're surviving this okay our reserves were okay but um you know it's i feel sorry if, you know my daughter works for gensler and Again, it was a big company. It's a lot of people to kind of keep, keep, uh, keep on the payroll, and they're doing a good job of it, actually. Yeah. So, yeah, and yeah. and they're and they're still working, and that's what I like. I mean, as designers, we, we're going to find different ways to work. You know, I'm going to yeah. work from home a little bit more. I think. You know, I know, I know. Before there was that little bit of like, like that work guilt for all of us yeah, workaholics, yeah, having too good of a time. But now I know how to pace myself. So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, listen, Michael, I can't say enough how much I respect you and um, honor you. So um, thankful for our friendship for over these years and how much you give the industry um, and how much we need. Um, we need you as a leader. Oh, well, thank you. Well, you you are our main leader. You, you're the one who bands us all together and, and keeps us on the right path. You know, I try, I try, I yeah. try. We, All right, well, I, I want to love my dear, you are deeply loved. Oh, thank you, Michael. You are too. So, wait, so let's do a bow first. So, we're like, we're going to do our respect bow, right? So, I love that idea, right? Bow. 
And then I always do the virtual hug. So this is like my virtual hug. Oh, oh that's so cute. <laughs> love you, girl. Okay. Uh, send my love to Alicia. I will. Okay. You take care. Stay safe. Bye, bye design friends. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank bye. you. Bye. This is Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design. Okay, friends, listen to this. It all started in a barn. Okay, you got to know about that. Then moved to the elevator, and now it's become SnapCab, a standalone, quiet, and safe workspace that's needed more than ever today. All right, and I've got these lovely gentlemen with me today, the founder and CEO, Glenn Bostock, and the sales manager, Jack Berkham. Hi, guys. Hey, Cindy. Yeah, it's great to see you all. Great to see you. It's great so, to be here. So, Glenn, you know, one thing that's kind of amazing about doing these interviews is that we do get to hear about the backstory and the evolution of a company. So, take me back to, I think it was 1983. Oh, really? Wow. That is going <laughs> Let's back. go back. <laughs> all right. Well, I uh, so went to college for fine woodworking. So I just have a community college degree in fine woodworking. Uh, my wife and I started a cabinet making business in a barn with some other college buddies. Quickly outgrew the barn. Uh, so we did custom cabinet work up until the 90s. And in the early 90s, we started remodeling elevators. Then in the late 90s, we came up with a systematic way to remodel elevators that took, took into account all the imperfections in elevators and their different sizes. And uh, I applied for a patent for that system for remodeling. And we ended up getting a national contract with Otis Elevator. Mm. Thank goodness they didn't come check my shop because there are only about four of us. I love that. I love that. But how, now, did, you get this, how did you get the first elevator? Like, how did that happen? Uh, my dad was partners in an elevator maintenance company. And he knew of a job that they needed a reception desk and they wanted the reception desk to meet the match the elevator. Uh, so I, I did them both. And when I went in to do the elevator, the architect said, oh, your price is way too low. I'm like, <laughs> Nobody ever says that to me. Wow. So like, Wait a, a minute. There's something to this. And then we started pursuing elevators. And it was the elevators that led to the pod product. Mm. Yeah, because there was some sort of... Um Tell me, there's some sort of interlocking uh, right. system with the panel, so, right? Right. So I'm in one of our pods now. Behind here is a row of screws, and the top panel hides the screws of the bottom panel. And you just have this nice decorative shadow line. So we, um, our, the product is really designed aesthetically to have no, uh, no grills and no visible fasteners. We handle the imperfections by using gaps, shadow lines, uh, floating ceilings. The walls actually float off the floor. So it's an incredibly beautiful product with no grills. And it's the forgiveness of the uh, product that makes it so that it's so flexible. So we can make these in all kinds of ways. That's amazing. Now, Jack, when did you come on board? I haven't been there that long. I've known Glenn for, for a very long time, but uh, I joined uh, just over a year ago to, to sort of help with some of the sales and business development for the pod side of uh, the business with SnapCab. Right. So what, what's your history with him then? Do you know each other for a long time? We've known each other here. Uh, we grew up like close to each other in Kingston oh, uh, yeah. and Wolf Island and had cottages near each other. And so we've talked about business uh, for decades. Amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I've been, I've always admired what Glenn's doing from a distance. And so, um, yeah, it's lucky for me to be able to come aboard and, and try to help out a bit. Mm. Can you believe no Neocon this year, you guys? Thank Sad. goodness for uh, internet, but holy cow. I, I, I know, holy cow. So, so you were, um, tell, tell me if I'm correct, uh, 
was it the first uh first year was a couple just a couple years ago right for snap yeah, i can i can uh, yeah let me give you a little bit of the history okay. with, uh, so we were getting a lot of traction with the elevator interiors mm -hmm. uh the elevator interior the elevator interior system we had attracted corning glass wow corning makes gorilla glass that's on your tablets and on your phones mm. And that's called Gorilla Glass. It's wow. a very thin, very clear, very tough glass. And they uh, they wanted to get their glass into the architectural world. So you can imagine if you paneled an airport, how many phones would it take to panel an airport? That's a lot of glass. Right. So you can back print the glass. You can back paint the glass. The glass makes the very best whiteboard on the market sure, because yeah. it's absolutely clear absolutely white and absolutely replaces completely so so they took our paneling system and asked us if we could make a product out of it for um for the elevators so we have a whole line of gorilla glass elevator interiors we took the gorilla glass elevator interiors and took them to the uh, aia show and neocon and showed showed you know paneling and Gorilla Glass and showed an elevator interior in Gorilla Glass. Uh, there was a consultant that worked for a very major uh, co-working company that we all know of. And um, they said they're desperate for pods, privacy pods. You, you know, if you put a door on this and paneled the outside, you'd have a pod. And he said, we need a lot of them. And I thought, okay, okay. well, you got my attention when he said, you need a lot. You need a lot of them, right? Yeah. A lot. So we developed the product and we started just by making this OSB boxes and working it out. And we made these prototypes. We came up with this product. And, but so we built this pod uh, out of, with an interior, uh, well, we built this pod, pod originally out of Gorilla Glass and showed it at Neocon. Right. And we, we won best of Neocon for that pod. In that was 2017, right? Yeah. That's right. Then 2018, we had our factory up and running. Uh, 2019, we ended up getting a UL rating. Uh, and then in 2000, now, now this year, our big announcement this year was that we're open line to the market and we're, we've got, a, a, well, two things, we're open line to the market and that we are, have a lot of different models to deal with the COVID issue. Right. And I mean, prior to that, it was, you were still, you still, you know, you're developing your company and it's going so fast, it seems like, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're, are you, is the factory in Canada? We have two factories. One's outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and one is in Canada. So, so Jack, what is, what's it like uh, working with the architecture and the design community? Yeah, it's a ton of fun. Um, you know, we started out, Glenn, as he, you know, described, started in elevators. And so he got into pods. We have this great pod, but the sales channels are a little different. Um, I think for the pod business than the elevator business. Um, and as Glenn said, our pods are kind of the Lexus and our elevators are uh, more of a Toyota type of brand. So it's, <laughs> it's like we're at different points in the market with the with our products and uh, the sales channel is different. And so we um, and, and this predates me joining the company, but um, Glenn had been told, look, you gotta sell through dealers. Um, and so he was trying to figure out, okay, first, how do I design the product? What's the best pod product? Um, and then what's the right channel? And he was being told, you, should, you, you know, really, if you wanna access the high-end commercial office space, a lot of them are buying through dealers. I think Glenn watched a pretty neat Netflix show on Harley Davidson, and that kind of tipped the scales towards realizing, like, yeah, okay, this is the way to go. Yes. So the yeah. getting it to the customer is not. Thank goodness for Jack. We, you know, it takes a while to design a a good product, uh, and then it takes a while to figure out what, like, what's the right sales channel. Our sales team is, um, it's a super small team, and I would say we're really more there to. You know, a lot of the guys on the team uh, came off of the trade floor. It's a company that's super, it's super neat because it's a lean manufacturing company, but 
so we're, we're focused on continuous improvement on the factory floor, but we're also focused on continuous improvement for the product and the, and the sales channel. And we need direct interaction with customers to understand what's going well, what's not going well. We can feed that information back to Glenn and he you know, has to take that and decide, okay, what are we gonna try to change or improve? And it's great. And, but we're, I mean, we're, we're learning as much as we are educating, I would say along the way. I like, I like that you're like learning and growing and adapting at the same time. And certainly for the architecture and the design community, you know, they'll tell you what they need, <laughs> you know, you got to listen right. to them. They tell you what right. they need, which is, which is great. So let's, so let's talk about the pods. Okay. So first of all, uh, what makes that, what makes these pods special? Jack, do you want to take that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah so, uh, what what I like to say is not not necessarily so much what I love about them, but more what I hear. We get specced into jobs by big name A and D firms, mm -hmm. and so we try to find out from them. Oh gosh, like right. why did you pick us? Right. And so what we talk about are three main pillars or legs of the stool. It's um, quality, safety, and flexibility, mm -hmm. and so. Um, those are things that we've all, we, we already understood and we put them forward and we've got, you know, a great warranty Our nobody at all really builds a pod like us. And I mean, the other pod manufacturers themselves, themselves will tell you that, um, our pods, you know, got a 10 year warranty, but the last for 40 years, um, I, we kind of think of the frame of the pod as being like a building. So if you own a building, it, you know, in New York City, the building's going to last 100 years, and then you need to refresh it every so often. Our pods are designed, as Glenn was explaining at the outset, around this um, interlocking modular patented paneling system. And so once you get the frame, you can replace the panels and you can change the form and function. And so I think it, this, it, it was designed, at a pod, it's designed specifically to be remodeled. Yeah, it's designed specifically to be flexible, right? No, that's wonderful. Now I saw, wait, first of all, it's tough, right? I saw someone hanging on the door. That's right. <laughs> right, so that's, that's to your point of like, it's a building, it needs to stay up, that's right? right. <laughs> or you I mean, can do exercises on it too. Yeah. Right. It's a very heavy duty, commercial grade uh, hinge. I saw the same hinge on the garage door at an airport, you know, right. it's made to be used. Right, that's, a, that's amazing. Then I would imagine, Glenn, it's because of your experience in the elevator business, the whole thing about the panels and being able to easily remove them, change them, that's right. et cetera. And the way they interlock, it makes the whole thing a cube that you could act, you know, they're made to be forklifted as well. You can lift the whole thing up. They're very structurally sound, which allowed us to put them on wheels. Ah, and they can so, roll around. Oh, so that's why, because I, I also saw a little clip that showed somebody moving them fairly easily. So is there, there are wheels, like hidden wheels underneath? Yeah, we have two different types of pods. One is designed for easy access uh, that goes right on the floor. There's another type that has a floor in it, and that one has large commercial casters. And for instance, uh, Jack and I are over here at uh, Fractal, it's a co-working company, and we remodeled their floor in, I think, like half an hour. Oh my goodness. You know, so. That's crazy. Know. And are they, and let's talk about them. So it's a co-working space. Now they, they want to be sensitive to everything that's going on with the pandemic, of course. And are they thinking, let's get a lot of these pods in right now and protect people. And then maybe when it's safer, they'll use them in different ways on the, on the floor. Uh, yes. They, when they called us, they said they were having a, uh, well, there, there was good news and bad news. The good news was that they had these little tiny offices that they were able to stay in business and continue to work uh, to, uh, rent the little single person offices. What they're having trouble with was the hot desking area the large area where everybody gets together right. on couches and and on these uh, large, you know, big tables and like a library. Um, yeah, that's it. No, that's really interesting. And so since you're developing this company, that's like it kind of exploding. Um, how have you adapted what you've already designed in response to COVID? So we, we, 
yeah, you know, it's sort of like, oh, here we are. And they're telling everybody to sit far apart. And our business was basically built on making little meeting pods like that fit, you know, right. four to six people in the smallest, like a diner booth in a right. diner, which is really a great space for communicating people, but not for preventing you from you know, spreading germs. So, but what we did is we converted the pods into, uh, you know, single person isolation pods. So it's, I'm sitting in one right now. This is a meet six. This had a, a table in it and benches for six people. Huh. We just took them out and we put in a, a desk that's, we've got a desk that you can adjust the height. And that's where I am right now. And I, you know, for this meeting, I adjusted the height because we do a lot of online meetings. And now I've got the camera directly across from where I'm sitting instead of, you know, most people looking down on their laptop. Right. Um, yeah, I didn't know. I didn't realize. I didn't realize after seeing them. I didn't realize that it kind of started more as like a collaborative booth. So that's interesting. That was that was the original idea. A diner in a box. Good thing you're flexible. <laughs> that's right. Now this this pod I'm in has a. Uh, you know, uh, this one has a plastic laminate surface. So this one's highly cleanable. Uh, even if you had uh, the synthetic felt, like uh, Jack is sitting in one that has yeah. synthetic felt, you can spray that with something that disinfects it. Um, but let's face it, you can't scrub down felt the way you can plastic laminate. Right. So if, so you'd have the choice of whatever material you want to make these out of. And if you, and if you had a, ordered it with that felt, you could just take those panels out, put them away, order these and put them in. Yeah, so Jack, like, how do you, we understand that, but like immediately you kind of have to pivot the story, right? Pivot the function, pivot the story. Um, yeah, I mean, our, our traditional market is commercial office space. And so I kind of think of the pod market as being bifurcated between two different types of products. There's more of the traditional phone booth, which is a one person um, smaller pod that people would use to go and generally might maybe just have a phone call, whether it's a work phone call or to talk to your spouse. Um, and we sell a lot of those. And there's a lot of companies selling different versions of the phone booths. And then there's larger pods. And so as Glenn was explaining, for a lot of our larger pods, they had started in its collaboration pods. Um, and so, you know, I our crystal ball is no better than anybody else's about what's going to happen. And so right now, there's not as many people in the office. They're going to start to come back. They might want different safety precautions in place. In the long run, we might well be back where we were before. Um, but we've retrofitted some of our larger pods so that they can be one person office or executive pods, um, which is neat. We've created a collaboration pod where you can actually use our traditional kind of diner booth collaboration pod and it's got a safety barrier now separate ceiling fans with HEPA filters that have positive air pressure and so we've had to learn a little bit about what is best practices for safety to amend our pod but that's a pod that allows two people to sit down what we're hearing is not everybody loves Zoom all the time. People miss being able to sit of with course. a colleague, yeah, and, and actually have a discussion. And so we we have something that we think might be a solution for that. And um, so that's kind of neat. Well, the collaboration pod, uh, the reason we did it was from a request from a church. So the, oh. the minister from the church said, you know, you, you can't read people the same over a phone call and over uh, video. And the, the people that are coming in can't afford, you know, people are coming to churches and under these stressful times to get counseling from ministers and they want to be able to see each other and hear each other. And so the door, the pod has two doors and as Jack mentioned, it's got two doors, two HEPA filter air systems, a glass wall and a sound system. Um, and we're installing that this Friday, tomorrow we're, we're installing that. Uh, we've been working with some hospital designers on uh, different types of testing and modular uh, hospital room pods. Um, and then as Glenn was saying, we've got a home office pod for people who might be, you know, some companies have said, okay, people can stay home for a year. 
um, we've got a version of our pod that you can sit in at home. So we're creating some new products, but yeah. I don't think we're turning our back on our core, our core commercial office yeah. market space. So Glenn, tell us about uh, building your own, you know, office pod at home. Okay. So this is the benefit of having your own company. Yeah, you get to be benefit. the guinea pig for the that home office pod. I had my office is up on a balcony and the, uh, so I was able to, and my wife was like, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to, I want to put an office up there. And she yeah. said, oh, it's just going to be, and she's just like, you know, I guess. And uh, anyway, so I matched the materials in my house and it looks amazing. I have and, to say, it looks amazing. I, I'm looking uh, at it, it looks amazing. You know, so we use natural cherry veneer. It's the first time we've used natural cherry. And uh, it's my favorite pod so far. And it's a meat tube because it went on a balcony. I didn't have that much space. So it's only 33 inches wide, but it sits two people. And That's a really nice. good story also for the design community because, you know, they want to custom everything. That's right. There's another pod that's com we're coming out with. It's an outdoor pod. And out my back, the back of my house looks over a wind farm and the front of the house looks over water. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna build a uh, exterior outdoor pod that has glass walls on both sides so you can get these views. Fantastic. Do you guys, do you guys say you like, you can, you know, install them in a snack? Is that part of your thing? For the pods, uh, it, it, I guess it takes a couple hours, but you know, it's like there's paneling on the inside and outside uh, because they come into all pieces, you know, small pieces uh if you have a door big enough for one we'll we'll deliver it in one piece but you can um you can take it into smaller pieces and then build them wherever you need them to go you also disassemble and reassemble into other buildings so yeah and i think that flexibility was back to what we talked about before you're saying the AD community wants to customize things that's that's what we hear that people do like the most is the ability a, a lot of um you know our, our pods have clean classic lines we work with some big tech companies on the design for them. And so if you want them to disappear into a space, you can have them with simple finishes and they can disappear. Uh, if you want it to pop, you can really make them pop. And so they're really customizable, which is which is something that we hear that people, it's, it's something they like a lot. So I understand there's, you have a new tagline, a space to be you. Yes. So that's your, that's your is that your nod to the flexibility? That, you know, the space to be you, uh, it, it, it goes to every level of SnapCab because it, the products, we expect people to go and be involved with these products and they can get it to be the size and the decoration that they need. But if you came to work for SnapCab, we, we are uh, just like the elevator product that was designed to fit into flawed cab shells. When we hire, um, people, we know they're going to be making mistakes and we've, we've designed the product around flaws and we've designed our company culture and our company systems around assuming everything has flaws. And if you take into account that everything has flaws, it means people are going to be comfortable. Like, like I, I love it because I make mistakes regularly and, and that's expected. And we have, uh, you know, and, and so when people send, when we send these pods out, and people are getting the pod they want and they realize they put their floor plan together in not the optimal way it's they can they can move them around and make it a space you know it's it's a it's a forgiving company it's forgiving to our customers our employees and the product itself is forgiving and it's always aiming towards making it so everybody can be themselves it's so interesting you know the time we're in is obviously very interesting but also the development of this company right now and the fact that you've you know made it so flexible so that you you can almost pivot pretty easily right. uh, as as all these things are shifting and changing you know, uh i know this is a stressful time for everybody and i can't say we've had the highest sales ever right now but i, I i've had a tremendous amount of fun because we're back in r d mode and we're right. we're inventing multiple kinds of different solutions to what the new need is and i'd say it's so awesome having a showroom where you can just walk right into the factory and what do you want to make and then that the guys will have it there the next day you know 
Right, isn't that your happy place? That is my happy place. Yeah, absolutely. I can see. Yeah. So, so I don't know if it makes uh, Jack is happy. I think it does. Jack, but, you well, said well, something. Well, Jack, well, I should take that back. Uh, <laughs> right now, if your happy place is building things, we're super happy. Uh, we're not doing a big volume of things, but we're doing a wide range of uh, of products. And I think it's going to lead to sales, which would be great. It's a lot of fun getting to find people. We, we like to find people that are interested in what we have to offer and try to be helpful and useful to them. And there's all kinds of those people out there. So um, it's it's going well. And yeah, it's super fun in the sales on the sales side as well as in the factory floor. I don't, Glenn never asked me to go like pick up a screwdriver and, and help. You know, well, you've it. offered to, and I think you you would be out there helping us. <laughs> yeah, well, I you know it when I'm listening to you all, I get excited too, and I kind of want to come over and build something with you. Well, yeah, <laughs> That's, yeah, it, you have that kind of spirit about you. Absolutely. Yeah, you know we you know we talk to companies and manufacturers that have been in business for twenty and thirty years, so it's super fun to talk about this kind of new niche and I love when it comes from like a different kind of industry and you're adapting it to a completely different market and our design industry needs you right now. Well we certainly enjoy being needed that's what we're here for. <laughs> it, it, like I think it's been a lot of fun because Glenn talks about this how Apple, Apple's one extreme where they went out and designed a product that nobody in the market was asking for at all and that's that's pretty incredible if you can do that. You know, at the other extreme, there's lots of companies even in our uh, sector that are all doing the same thing. It all looks exactly the same. You know, I feel like um, we've landed somewhere in the middle. When Glenn decided to make a pod, he didn't really look at what other people were doing. He went out and designed what he thought was a great product for the problem that was there. We, right. we didn't create something without knowing there was a problem, but we saw, okay, there needs to be a solution here. And he went and designed something. and so. As I said, it, there's some similarities because they're all privacy booths, but ours is yeah. radically different than everybody else's. And it's because Glenn just went and built what he thought made sense. After he'd done that, now I'm the eyes and ears in the market that feeds him information and we do respond to it. And we say, okay, yeah. they care a little bit more about this thing than this thing. And so we can respond to that. And so uh, in that sense, you know, we've landed in the middle. It's a lot of fun. I mean, in a way, when I, I mean, when I think of our industry, and I see the product, it's it's kind of like a, a, a building block for a space. Mm -hmm. So it can kind of be anything. And designers yeah. and architects love that. <laughs> yes, they well, want to imagine their own, you know? Well, and speaking of building blocks, Cindy, uh, so we, all of our pods, and I don't know if this is well known or not, but from the very beginning, we built them so that the, there's a decorative corner that actually makes it so it links up to other pods. We have another product called Connects Walls. So you can put the mountable walls between the pods. Mm. And then we have all kinds of pods that link together. We have uh, what we call, what's called a nurture pod for nursing mothers and then the handicap pods. And uh, we have a new little talk booth that's it's for just a standing phone booth, very small footprint. In fact, that, that pod is neat in that it doesn't need any assembly. We can just deliver it to you like a refrigerator and you just bring it in on hand track and tip it up and plug it in and away you go. Um, so I, I like you were talking about the, I mean, is ventilation obviously is an issue. Right. So what we're doing for the ventilation now is we're uh, having the air blow into the pod. So it's po po positively pressured and the air that's coming in goes through a HEPA filter. So, uh, so if you wanted to work in a space and feel like, Okay, I am at work and I'm kind of concerned, but when I get into my pod, I know I'm safe. Uh, so that's what they're designed for now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's wonderful. Listen, it's been great talking to you guys and hearing the backstory. It's also interesting. I I love how you're adapting to everything that's going on in the world today. We all need to. If you're not, you might as well get out of the business, right? And it seems like you're on a really strong trajectory. Uh, it's been so much fun, Glenn. Thank you so much. Jack, thank you so much. I'm glad you guys got together. And thank you for SnapCab. And I look forward to um, a lot more talks in the future about a lot more products. Great. Yeah, thanks thank a lot, Cindy. Cindy.
Yeah, and, and happy Neocon, even though we're far away. Yeah. Uh, sending you all a virtual hug, and I look forward to meeting you in person next year, right? Yes, yes. we'll all be back. Yes, exactly. Okay, thanks everybody. Good Thank energy you. out to the world. Thank Good you. Energy. It's Bye. in a snap, snap cab, in a snap. Everybody, this is Cindy Allen, editor in chief of Interior Design. Now more than ever, we want to hear some good news and inspiration. And what better way than sharing some super cool ideas from a special student program called the Form Student Innovation Competition by our friends at Formica. And I am delighted to chat today with the VP of Marketing and another friend, Amy Gath. How are you, Amy? I am great. It's great to be with you, Cindy. It's great to see you. Okay, so I'm really excited about this competition, um, the Forum Student Innovation Competition. Well, you know what I like so much is that I heard that it really started years ago in another way. And I think we always, um, when we dig back, we find these treasures. And I think you had one. So what had it been originally? Absolutely. So back in 2008, Formica did a challenge with the architectural greats, and it was called Form. Um, also, the architectural challenge, contemporary architects at play. And we had folks like Zaha Hadid and Michael Graves and Massimo Vanelli um, create something you could sit upon, lie upon, or play upon out of Formica. I love and that. Oh, I mean, amazing things that, that they came up with and I, so inspiring. Actually, we still have many of the pieces, one of the collections in our office, and it's so fun to walk around and see these pieces and this just, it, it's very inspiring. Um, so in 2018, we said we should repeat this with students um, as a tribute to the greats that we worked with a decade ago. Yeah, and you know, I remember um, the good old days, you know, there were the there would be these programs that these these projects that these that these architects and designers did what they designed were really like sculptures honestly they were they were works of art and it made and it made a lot of sense that you were doing it back then and now reimagining it for today which I love but I did you know something I something I noticed when I looked through all of the work uh, and I have a list here. It was Peter Eiserman, Lorinda Speer, mm -hmm. um, is it Jaime Velez? Yes. With Jennifer Kolstad, Zahadid, Bill Peterson. This is amazing. Thomas Main, Buzz Udell, Michael Graves, Massimo Vignelli, and Bernard Schumi. Unbelievable. But when yes. I look through the projects and I look through all of their pieces, what was kind of interesting is how they all had their own interpretations, obviously, but also they used all different types of formica. So you must have said the world's your oyster and your world's, your world's formica and there was laminate and veneer and color core, color through, solid surfacing. It was so exciting. Oh, it was, it was so amazing. And it is, I mean, Zaha, who we said you have an eight by eight box to play within and, and took up every inch of Perfect. that eight by eight spot and and you know michael graves who created such a beautiful but simple fits right in i mean it it really was fun to see their personalities come to life in their work and don't you think it's funny so you, you said like there are these are there pieces or kind of miniatures in your office oh there's the real thing the big oh, the real pieces. Thing. yeah so you were walking by them <laughs> for all these years and then it's sort of like oh why don't we reimagine this idea right that's exactly right. And I think part of it was really spurred by so many of them had passed. And it was, you know, what a wonderful piece of history and, you know, what a way to pay tribute to these greats who students are learning about and studying and admiring so much. So let's challenge students to do what, what the greats did to learn. Right, so tell that. us about, so tell us how you, um, how you sort of imagined what this could be and how you pushed it out to the student world. 
A absolutely. So I, I mean, this was a full on right. We went to we went to universities across the U.S. and Canada. We sent emails and we did, you know, we really got into the digital world where students right. are and and you know, it was fantastic because we had some professors who said, you know what, I'm going to make this my class final project. Um, I that. And, and I think what has been fascinating to us is as we went into kind of lockdown across the country, a lot of students said, you know what, I, I want to do this now. And so we had just this waterfall of entries come in um, towards the end. And it was, it was really inspiring. And it, it has just been so fun to go through them and see 150 entries, um, 178 students all together, um, some group entries. So it was, it was just really fun. And it was fun to have professors call and say, you know, uh, students need to remember how to work with different materials. And this really pushes the bounds of teaching design and teaching how to think about it. Right, exactly. And yeah, I saw somewhere it was like 40 schools, which is unbelievable. First of all, I would like to say something. I love Formica. Can I just say that? Like, oh, thank I you. I have used Formica in so many projects. I just love it. So I'm so glad that they get they got to like dig into it. And another thing I, I wanted to thank you because you all um, produced our hip awards last year and we did have so much fun with that and i wore my polka dots because we did that really cute polka dot hip award and the designers loved it so you're like you know you're that essential element that gives them um freedom to imagine whatever they they want I, that's absolutely right. We loved doing the HIP Awards because it really gave us an opportunity to kind of push and try different things and show what the material could do. And, right. and that's what we wanted the students to do too, was push the boundaries, try something because you're not limited with laminate. And that was, that was very cool to see what they came up with. I love that, not limited with laminate. <laughs> you got a whole new slogan <laughs> that I didn't know about. Fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna play this kind of fun game, uh, you and I. Uh, yes. because there are 10 and we're going to go from 10 all the way to the winner. All right. Yes. And we're going to like play off each other. Okay. So you're number 10, Amy. Go. All right. All right. So our 10th place winner is called geode table. It is done by Brandon Freely from Marywood university. And I, we love this. Our judges love this. We had a fantastic panel of jur a jury panel um, because this table replicates geode. So it's beautiful and then you open it up and it's incredible on the inside. So fantastic work, Brandon, congratulations. Yeah, it's great. I love that the, that the color was different on the inside, which made it like a surprise, right? Yes, and he used the metals on the inside. So it is kind of like a geo where it sparkles a little bit. Oh, that's true. I saw that purple. I thought that purple was kind of interesting too. Okay, yeah. so number nine, our ninth place, it's called the Nordic Chair. And it's by Gabrielle. The shape was beautiful. And yes. um, what she said was that the shape was a mixture between a circuit board and the growth of rings of a tree. And what a lot of the kids were saying, they were kind of playing with this idea of nature and technology, which was really fun. And she also liked the idea of using solar orange laminate, which I love, I love Yes. That. She said that the name was, was reminding of the Northern landscapes and I don't know, sort of an iceberg and I'm feeling chilly just even thinking about it. It, it I, was fabulous. And, and I really liked, I mean, I think, it was a very kind of natural organic shape, but it also had kind of that tech influence to it. It did, which, it right, did. Super, super cool capturing that blurred lines theme. Yeah. yeah I love that one. Super, yeah. okay. So now what are we on to eight? Number eight. We're on Go to eight. So, so eight was a team effort um, and it was from Algonquin University in Canada, a team of Huang Hong and Devanshi Gulati. And um, this is kind of a, a flexible moving part table. I love this um, because it's got the woods and then it's got yeah. the wood patterns and then it's got a felt and a bubbles laminate, mm -hmm. um, yes. which I, I think just the combination kind of really captured the blurred lines. But then I loved that it could expand and it had hidden storage. So That's I love the functionality too. Super smart. I mean, don't you love like these kids? They're like, you know, freedom of ideas and, they're gonna make it happen. I, I do, and I, I like that too, because I was thinking, oh my gosh, that'd make my house look so much better. <laughs> like, that's fabulous. <laughs> there you go, you got some designers you could hire. Exactly, okay. I need them. In seventh place, we have 
The Nia Table by Elaine Chow, and she's from Sheridan College. And she says it's the perfect combination of three geometric shapes, the circle, the rectangle, and the semicircle. So that was mm -hmm. sort of her idea. And this, this thinking about interchangeability and flexibility. And um, she liked, let me see what she said. She said she liked the Surface Set 2020 collection because this is so cute. She liked its humanistic sensibility, nature inspired hues like algae <laughs> and a future forward palette that blends synthetic design with natural as seen in the Softwood collection. So she really like dug into what she wanted on that. Which I, lo I love that. And I, I really love the functionality of what she created because it's something that can be used vertically or horizontally. And I thought that was really clever and just perfect for kind of any space where you want to fit it. I, she did a fantastic job. Yeah, I didn't realize that, by the way. I know you're seeing, you were definitely way more in depth than I was, but I, now that you say that, I'm saying, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Looking at the images, that was super, that was a super fun idea. Okay. Yeah. We're up to sixth, sixth place. It's getting, getting very, very exciting, everybody. I know it is. So sixth place is the Tech Shelf by McCall Podelsky from Weber State University. Weber State has been a participant in our competitions for many years. We've gotten great stuff from them. And, and this is a shelf that really helps folks kind of put their text, their tech stuff away and kind of step away and recharge and what i loved was it's beautiful kind of simple curving line i love that, I love that. Um, and then i love kind of the blonde cedar wood with these pops of color very fun yeah i like that they color blocked you know and they were color blocking in areas that you wouldn't normally think because they were doing it on the curve which yes. was so lovely right i which, take one of those I, they're it's fantastic yeah, and I, you know what I loved as as a person who loves laminate, I loved that they showed, you know, laminate can bend. It's not this kind of rigid material. It does have that flexibility. So I, I love that he used that too. Yeah, good job. Good job. Okay. Yeah. So now we're in fifth place and we have the Imagination Bench by Allison Plunkett of Marywood University. I love all these schools. And if you think yes. about, you know, the next generation um, of designers, they're all over the place and they're thinking about you they're thinking about for mike it's fantastic so hers was very cute she talks about her imagination bench emulating the stages of life of a plant from germination and growth to pollination and seed spreading fabulous your ma imagination allison is fantastic but what i really loved about it were the strong lines and the strong primary, she wanted matte colors. And matte is, I love, I love matte and Formica. And yes. then she added this very creative, Allison, fantastic, this special touch of that um, marker board. Yes. And so that was the thing to me that was really exciting because she's so, showing the kids on their writing. And that meant she really understood the range of what Formica has. I, I love that. And I loved kind of the flexibility of the bench too, with so many different things that you can do. It's, it's kind of like when your little kids get old toys and it, it kind of lets their imagination go wild. And I, I really like that about the imagination bench. I can see kids using it in so many ways. Allison, congratulations. Great job. Okay. Now we're up to fourth place. Yes, and this is our second team in the top 10. It's called Duality by Matthew Lamb and Benjamin Ma from the University of Waterloo. Um, and, and this one's kind of similar in, in a way to the geo table in right. that um, you know it opens up to reveal something that was completely new and loved kind of the shape that was both natural but also very kind of technical and really captured that blurred lines. Um, theme really well and and they used our great kind of natural patterns elemental stone layered sand planked urban oak yeah don't you think that's kind of amazing too that i mean you had a series of judges but you this the range is so varied from one person to the other although there are hard themes that people are are you know very much passionate about these days so it just shows mm -hmm. like you can do whatever you want and there's there's a solution for it okay so That's we right. have in third place, the G table by Jessica Reed, and she's from Marywood University. And uh, she talks, she talks also, see that they're, they're very um, uh, probably passionate and conflicted at the same time about nature and technology, right? Yes. 
Yeah, so she's talking about the two separate entities functioning. She wants it to be harmonious. So uh, she has, she has it. I don't, what is this black crystal finish for mica? What is that? So it's got a little bit of a sparkle, a little <laughs> bit of a gloss to it, um, which I think looks kind of technical, techy. Yeah, right. So she wants, so she wants that to represent formality. Okay, I get that. And then the white wash birch ply laminate represents nature for her. And then this is what's really interesting. She wanted to use copper, and the copper showed the most advanced in technology. And for her, it was electricity. And I just thought that was so that was so clever. And she yeah. she really brought together her thinking about nature and technology into this beautiful piece. So congratulations, that number three, we're getting really close to the big winner. So number two is your, is your call, Amy. Yes, oh, I'm so excited. And, and I will say that the top three we'll see at Neocon next year. So we didn't get to bring them this year, but they're coming next year. Oh my God, you know what's so funny you say that? Because I saw, I was reading somewhere that you're gonna show them at Neocon and I thought, oh, I hope it's more than just the winner. I hope it's the, a few of them, fantastic, I love that. Yeah, so all our top three are coming to Neocon next year. We're excited to see them. Um, so number two uh, is the post-industrial bookshelf from Jacob Ethier at Quebec University. And I mean, this is amazing. It's a big piece um, with these brilliant orange colors. And what I love is, is the detail that he created in it. It's got hidden shelving. It's got these laser cut panels. And you look at it one way and you don't see what's stored on the shelves. And then you can kind of see on the sides. Um, and, and just the use of orange. I think it, orange is such a happy color. It just feels so good um, that this piece just feels good. And that's really what we heard from our judges. I, I'm crazy for this one, frankly. I think this one is fantastic. It's very sophisticated. It shows somebody who really is, is you know, working on their language for, for the future. I love the hidden component. As you said, the orange, crazy for the orange, and the fact that they did this patterning on it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Which, I mean, I mean, another thing we, we laminate people love, too, is just showing the kind of the level of detail you can get to in laminate. So thank you, Jacob. Thank you so much. It was fantastic, Jacob. I loved it. Congratulations. So drum roll, please. All right. Uh, first place Yay. winner in the forum student innovation competition goes to Alexandra Clement from Jean sur Richelieu, which is actually the uh, the place where Formica Canada started. Are you kidding? So, no. This is the Canadian province of Quebec. Yes. That's crazy. Alexandra Clement, you are the first place winner and we are yes we are that that's kind of crazy yes i that was just uh, that was a crazy coincidence Absolutely. and amazing so fantastic and and alexandra is winning for the origami which is actually a desk and allows you to you know origami right now is really really in trend i have to say and there's something so beautiful and light and architectural so when you can kind of get that mix right which is what she did that's why i'm sure the judges were responding to it so it's a desk that plays with shapes and volumes and it causes the desk to challenge proportions i love that it moves it opens and yes. she was thinking that it could be a school desk or it could be a resi residential desk or even in an office which as you can see it could work in all of those and it's sort of interesting she she listed her for mica all in French, which I would completely mangle, but I, I believe it is white layered sand, oiled uh -huh. olive wood, and whitewashed birch ply. Did I get that right? You got that perfect, yes. <laughs> so tell us about the judges. Was it in-house? No, we had and uh, we had one fabulous in-house, which is Renee Hytre Darrington, our global uh, our global head of design for Formica. But then we had a, a really cool jury. So Leanne Ford, our great friend, oh, and God. yeah, so we were Lovely. excited to have her. Yeah. Um, Tristan Butterfield from oh, Gensler and Kohler um, was part of it. Cheryl Durst was oh God, on our jury. <laughs> yeah, next year you should be on our jury. All right. Um, 
And then Vern Yip was also um, interior designer and television personality. So, I mean, just such a creative and cool group with amazing thoughts on design. So we really had fun with them. Do you remember what they said about uh, the first place winner about origami? I, you know what, I think just looking across the board, score, score top, of, top of the charts for yeah. creativity and functionality and really using the material in a unique and different way. And, and something that was so complicated, but right. so simple. Right. And it was truly beautiful. Well, to all the top 10, a huge congratulations. First of all, look at the judges that were looking at your work, which is amazing. That Formica is supporting you. And the fact that we're talking about you right now is kind yes. of fantastic. But there's, so we have that. Uh, but there's some other good news that you want to share, um, Amy. So tell us about um, tell us about it. That's right. So last year, actually about this time, um, Formica was purchased by a company called Broadview Holdings, and that brought to us two amazing sister companies, ARPA and Trespa. And ARPA has had this amazing product called Phoenix. It is a soft touch, super matte, anti-fingerprint, self-healing product. Oh, it feels so good, yes. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is a pettable product. It just feels so pettable? good. Pettable, oh, I love that. Is that an yeah. Amy-ism, pettable? It's an Amyism. yes, it's pettable, <laughs> um, which I appreciate also right now. It's kind of gross, we don't want to touch stuff, but you just have to touch this product, it's fabulous. Um, but it, it brought um, Phoenix, the Phoenix line to us, and so, they are, Broadview is fantastic about innovation and sharing innovation and kind of technology transfer. And so we are now producing Phoenix here in North America in sizes for North American designers. You get it with kind of Formica speed and distribution. Um, and we are just thrilled to be able to launch this gorgeous line because it is, it is truly beautiful. It's fantastic. So I, so I understand it's in a nice color range, 16 colors, I think, right now? 16 yeah. colors, that's right. Um, 16 colors of a, a thin and then we have a color through and then we have a gorgeous kind of color through compact or thick product which is perfect for kind of tabletops and countertops and um, just that kind of consistency of color is really gorgeous. It must you know it's like it's like having more materials for a designer to imagine right? That's exactly right. And, and I think it's been really fun for our Formica team to talk to designers. It kind of feels like Christmas. We have this for you and we have this for you and we have this for you. So that's, I, it's just been fun to add more to the creative toolbox for the design community. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure they get really, really excited to see. And also it's surprising, right? This is super, this is super chic. This is, this is very Euro, super chic. So it's a nice compliment, don't you think? It, it absolutely is. I mean, very much Italian design. And I think for us at Formica, it has really been fun to bring in the best of Italian design into our company and have that now be part of our DNA. Yeah, and Amy, so how are you, how are you guys doing? I understand that where you are, there are very few um, issues right now. I know you're being very careful. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's been, you know, relatively low here in Ohio. We were, Formica has been up and running throughout the lockdown as, as a essential business and creating surfaces for healthcare, um, which is wonderful, but also a, a tough, but we're, we're doing well. Um, and it's been, our team has had a lot of fun spending time on zoom um, with designers. And, uh, you know, we've had, We've had Wine Fridays um, with our, our design friends and, um, you know, but we're, we're doing well. Yeah, yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad. And so what is the thing that you're sort of most excited about for, for MICA in the future? What are the conversations um, that, are you, that you're having right now? You know, I'm really excited just about pushing the boundaries of surfacing with our Broadview parent company, they have an amazing center for surface innovation called Nemo. And it's 80 people in the Netherlands, surface chemists and technologists. And oh, oh, it's so cool. And so to be able to tap into their knowledge and kind of the collective experience of now our sister companies, I can't wait for the new things that we have coming down the pike. 
So that's what I'm excited about. And it's, you know, that's a cool thing too, to start to talk to the design community more about what do you wish you had? What are you missing? Um, and we want to create that then. So. Yeah, now you have, I mean, you, now you have the capabilities in a way that I don't know if anybody else does. It seems like it's almost the perfect timing. I hate to say anything's perfect right now, but the perfect yeah. timing to be able to really dig into the problems and try to find solutions for the designers because you know everything everything is changing in that way but you've already like got it in place yeah that that's absolutely right and you know if there is a silver lining to this i think it is it has given people an opportunity to kind of stop and pause and really think about what do i want what do i need going forward and and you do see creativity flourish and and you know we want to we want to be part of that creativity that flourishes and help it flourish afterwards for something bigger and better yeah we say you know we say now that you know health and wellness is going to be sort of in on everybody's lips moving forward and yeah you you're you're sitting right there mm -hmm. and, and thinking about how do we bring health and wellness to every space because there are surfaces everywhere we go and that's such an important part of health and wellness you want healthy surfaces right so. and you know what the designers i, I have a good friend in um been doing health care health health care and then health and wellness her whole career and she said you know it's our responsibility as designers moving forward that we still have to create beauty. Yes, everyone's gonna be really interested in that something's antimicrobial, but it's our responsibility to make it beautiful. Well, and I, I mean, what an amazing point, because I think beauty is part of wellness. Having beautiful things in our lives help us be well. So I, I love that, yeah. Yeah, so um, basically the world's your oyster right now, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> and and we're, we're glad it's our oyster and, and we're excited to have, you know, I think one of the unique things about our industry, about kind of the world in which we live is the partnerships that, you know, manufacturers and designers and architects are constantly talking and working together and playing with materials and, and figuring out how to elevate together. And that's, that's not every piece of, of the world. Um, so it's it's a special place to be right now. Right. I think we will get on the other side and conquer it together for sure. Um, I was so pleased to hear about this competition that it was so wildly successful that yes. the entries were fantastic, that you have great students from all over the country and Canada. By the way, amazing work coming out of Canada. And uh, that people are that people are really being creative with for Micah. And then your new, the, is it an acquisition or a partnership? It's a partnership. It's partnership. a partnership. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and I mean, the, the cool thing is uh, we have never virtually launched a product before. And starting May 5th, we started virtually launching a product. And so, I mean, super cool to, you know, send someone samples and have them sit on them for a week. And then we do a presentation and they go through their samples online. And I, I love it. I, I think it's changed, you know, the world will change as we go through this and as we come out of it, but the ways in which are, are there'll be some really cool things. Um, well, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank you for your continued partnership with us. It means so much to us and for all that you're doing for the design industry, for Micah and Amy Gath, um, we thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Cindy. This was fantastic. We're excited to, we love being a partner with interior design. So thank yeah. you. Yay. And yay to the students. A big congrats yay. to the students. Yay. The smartphone. How did we ever live without it? And now it has become a powerful tool for all you designers and architects. Interior Design is excited to introduce Launch, a new feature right inside the magazine that's built around the smartphone. Launch allows for the speed and efficiency of a digital platform while providing the inspiration and curation of a magazine. So you may ask, well, how does it work? Just point your phone at a launch code and it will activate a powerful, intuitive user interface. One in which you can instantly select from multiple actions, all at the touch of a button. Do you want to, say, download a spec sheet? How about contact a rep? or just get a sample.
Launch will help you discover the newest products in the market and easily take action. Now, keep your eye out for it. We are Love and Launch. There's something that I always find so beautiful about Jim's work. There's sort of this almost luminescence to the work, like when you walk through the forests or you experience the, the, the skies in the Seattle area. There's sort of a, there's sort of a character, there's a, there's a grounding in that kind of atmosphere, which I think is fantastic, it's beautiful. To me, the greatest luxury is being close to nature. Well, and I always say, how could I design anything how could we design anything that's more beautiful than the natural world? I mean, that's our muse, our touchstone. So in a way, the architecture, the interiors, everything is somewhat subservient to what's happening outside in these incredible landscapes. I grew up in the Northwest, and I always loved art. I liked to draw, but I also liked to like make forts in the woods. I always loved to be outside, and I like to try to make indoor spaces feel as though they're outside. Wow. So in this direction, we're looking out into nature, and then on this side, we're really looking at the art. And American Place is a good example of the house weaving itself into nature. This is like paradise, <laughs> no? It is, is paradise. Like, yeah. For me, it's one of Jim's best houses because I think it just speaks to this climate, this sort of landscape so clearly. In western Washington, the trees are tall, they have canopies and things, and so you're like in the environment in a different way. The landscape, the architecture, the interiors, furnishings, art, all that, to me it's, it's all one thing. And I think Tom in eastern uh, Washington, it's sort of more wide open space and things are clear and he does these, you know, really strong shapes and forms and objects that are out there on the landscape. I grew up in a high desert. It's harder, it's more extreme, it's more like raw in a way. I can kind of clearly see that there's a desire for that rawness or there's a desire for that edge that seems to be comfortable for me to sort of explore. This house is important for me because it was really the first house where I had a client that actually understood the beauty of steel. Mm. Just the beauty of raw steel, natural steel, and in this case, blackened steel. Oh. And so that's what's great about the residential arena is that you can make these connections with clients that just allow you to go somewhere where you always wanted to go. My dad's an architect, and uh, I grew up around architects and artists. When I left home, I was really more interested in sciences, hard sciences. And although I was interested in it, there was something that was missing in my life, and it was this, uh, this sort of craziness, that I, uh, this sort of art, this sort of poetry that I grew up with. My little thing came out of art, and, and Tom's came out of physics, and he calls it his weirdness. And so. I have my weirdness over here and his is over there. But I think they both are sort of vehicles for a way to get into architecture. And architecture is about life. It isn't about buildings. It's about all kinds of things. I joined the firm in 1986 and I had been with a small firm up in Alaska. So there was a sort of an overlay there with the big natural landscape of Alaska, of course, the climbing, skiing scene, and then doing architecture in this big wild country. The great thing about climbing was there's a leader on the rope, but then there was always somebody backing them up. And you would actually sort of flip, you know, on the route as you went up the mountain. And I always thought that was such a great sort of 
partnership model in a way because sometimes you were the lead on the rope, you were the one taking the risk, you were the one that was hanging it out, but you had a partner there, you had somebody belaying you. There's absolute respect and protection and sort of support system that allows uh, each person to sort of lead. So the idea of this house is that it sort of Beautiful. opens and closes to that environment. It's all about understanding the local climate conditions, the local sun conditions, and how do you translate that understanding into a building. In northwestern Washington state, light is scarce, especially in the winter. And so probably the most important thing we could do is bring in natural light. The light catcher might be the best illustration of using natural light and sunlight. The Mission Hill Winery is all about not getting light down into the cellar. The tower is actually used as the luminaire so that when people come from the very bright sunlight that they can have this transition through the stairs they come into the cellar below. Wow, what a beautiful spot you yeah. have. I'm really interested in light, but I'm also interested in how glass transmits and oh. reflects. I think the glass is a really great material to constantly be tweaking and fussing with. I don't think I've ever been in a space like this before. It's well, like this prism, right? Of yeah, holiness, exactly. you know? <laughs> exactly. It isn't really officially open to the public mm. yet. So you're getting a little sneak preview of uh, Chapel of the Future here in, in Seattle. Here we are right on a busy downtown street corner, yet it's completely open. And so people can sit in here and have a very different kind of feeling of sanctuary. Yes, yes. We're both little kids trying to get outside. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, you're doing beautiful architecture and interiors. You well, know, but they're every bit the part of the exterior. In fact, that's, that's the whole idea. Is how do you bring that exterior back into the interior and vice versa? The idea here is you basically can open up your studio or your gallery completely to the alley below so you can bring up materials. It's like I mean, a bolt. But you just kind of bolt like... <laughs> I think we need to talk about that instinct for you to open things. I remember growing up with that sort of frustration that these houses couldn't kind of like breathe to the outside. So I had a client and he said, geez, I wish it's such a beautiful place. It's such a beautiful view. I wish we could just open up the entire front end of the house. And I went, all you were right. like, that's, uh, it. that's all I needed to hear. <laughs> And that was an important project for me because the physics involved, the engineering involved, finally opening the front end of a house to the outside. So your living room becomes basically right. your deck. Yeah, you can see that. Ideas in this office are whatever you want to imagine. You can imagine it and then try to make something happen out of it. Jim brought up this idea, oh, there's a storefront, you know, we yeah. should rent it because this area is going through some tough times in, in Seattle. Alan Maskin and Kirsten, our two other partners, got a hold of the idea and took it way beyond yeah. what I had imagined. We're able to provide design to people who have ideas and we build these ideas together. Each month, it's something different and a new group takes it over. We've created 12 completely different experiments and installations uh, that have been open to the public. It, it, it has no constraints. It allows kind of an open framework for doing interesting things. We can say yes to things. The main reason that we're here is to try to do the best design that we possibly can, whatever that means to us. I think there's this <laughs> earnestness about both of us about what we're doing. Like we're really into it. I mean, like we really are into it. It's not just an architecture firm. It's not just an art firm. It's not any, you know, design firm. It, it's design is, it's like an attitude about making our world a better place. Hey everybody, this is Cindy Allen, editor-in-chief of Interior Design. 
You've just watched our mini documentary we produced a few years back when we were inducting Olson Kundig into the Hall of Fame. And now we have a live, and it's a real treat, Tom Kundig. Hi, Tom. Oh, hi, Cindy. Real treat to see you digitally, but it's fantastic as always. I know, it's so funny. Um, people don't know this about you. One thing they're gonna learn right away is it is so early. It's 10 o'clock my time, but seven in the morning we're filming you. That's insane. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that is a little insane, but honestly, uh, mornings are some of my best times because as, as you know, you're either doing your design work in the evening, like a lot of designers do, or you do it in the morning. I'm a morning person. Yeah. I love that. Cause I, you know, yesterday I was checking, I said, just check with their people. Just make sure that we're talking about seven in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. I'm <laughs> sure they, I'm sure they had no problem saying that. No, problem. I know. I know. I know. going to be a problem. Well, listen, the last time I saw you, you were giving me a sneak peek mm. into a new project and not what everyone else thinks because it's a book, your fourth book. And um, we were all excited. We were in New York together, remember? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You saw, oh, I had like a big pile of paper with all right. sorts of disorganized in many ways, but you immediately got it, which is... Yeah, well, you know, we call them galleys, but I love seeing... The behind this the behind the scenes and and just talking to you about it you know it's it and it always reminds me of being an editor right this is when i see the architect as editor and i always feel that kind of kinship of you critiquing your own work in a printed version of it Ooh, that's pretty interesting i i completely agree with that i think sometimes the background work is as interesting as as the finished project in fact, sometimes when a when a project is under construction, that's sometimes the most inspirational moment of a project because you see this thing that is developing and you don't necessarily have an understanding of how it is being developed. And sometimes it's un, it's an unbelievable source of inspiration to yeah. to go to a next to do, to maybe go to a next uh, exploration. Yeah, I couldn't agree that. more. I love that. And you know, there are a few things that we want to share with people. First of all, there was something lovely that was sent to me about you growing up in Spokane and mm -hmm. how the whole mining and lumber and agriculture, mm -hmm. how that has framed everything you do, which by the way, when you hear that, it makes complete sense. <laughs> well, that's, that's pretty interesting but because there is, there's a conflict there, right? Because mining and the lumber industry and even uh, agriculture industry are actually environmentally pretty aggressive, mm -hmm. frankly. And, and I think I recognize that even as a kid, certainly in the silver mines of, of northern Idaho. But there was something about uh, the way those things operated and the way they were invented to operate because our ancestors were so smart about being able to use existing physics and you know on all levels hydrology gravity whatever and i just as a kid for whatever reason found them very interesting to uh to watch basically yeah but that that's become your life's work right it's like you were dreaming another way to use everything and another way to see things which is so exciting well yeah you're right cindy because in fact uh to watch those things and to watch actually most things i mean even culturally what we're going through right now it's all about the it's all about nature it's all about how does nature work and obviously the way nature works the nature of nature is really important to to how i think about everything i do every day of my life so it's uh, mm -hmm. it's just a component and uh, it was a, it was an incredible source of inspiration, and remains uh, an incredible source of inspiration. I grew up working for an artist on his sculptures, mm -hmm. and honestly, I think sometimes the sculptures were more interesting in the process of happening, uh -huh. in the process of these things sort of emerging, and the way Harold would hammer out shapes and how he would sort of invent how to make things. Completely fascinating as for a kid. I, lo I love that. All right, so let's, so let's get to the book. Um, I think you need to first tell us uh, why the name, which is working title. <laughs> I don't even know. It was like, well, it, you know, some people say, well, it's because you're always working. And so you're always thinking about the word work. And I, and I honestly, I answer, well, you know, it's interesting you say that because in a way, I, what I do is work, whatever that means, is not really work. I just, um, you know, I, I 
spend all an inordinate amount of hours just doing what I do. So it's not work has a funny has a, a funny connotation. I actually think it's kind of a fantastic word because you're making things, you're changing potentially the world for a for a for a better better way. And working title, honestly, you know, I see it in the movies. You know, of course, when they're sort of um, trying to figure out, you know, how right. that title might work. And I just love that um, term, working title, because it means that things are in transition, things are kind of being reconsidered, and that's the way this book is supposed to uh, come off. Is that this is a trans? You know, I'm, everybody's always in transition. Right. This is a transition, and um, working title is frankly implying that things are moving, things are changing. Yeah, well, it, it definitely it definitely gives you like a sense right away that it's going to be a special and little bit different book, which, which I do love. Now I know it, 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 um, it covers 29 projects and they're yeah. not, you know, they're pretty recent too. It's kind of yeah. fantastic. And the range, you know, we always talk to designers about ha trying to have a broad range, but the range is really, really broad from residential to commercial, mm -hmm. cultural, culinary, it's kind of fantastic. Mm -hmm. You get it all right. Well, see, and, and I'm sure, Cindy, you know better than anybody that I, what, what I've always said is that the residential arena, in fact, feeds all of these other projects because, you know, as a designer um, and the editor of, a, of a, a design, a super important design magazine, because you're all, you guys are also telling that story. Yeah. Basically, it doesn't really matter. Right. It's all about design. It's, some, it's about solving problems. It's about understanding the problem. And for an architect to understand the residential arena, I think informs everything, whether it's a, a wooden boat shop or whether it's a, a museum or a culinary uh, institution. It's all about, you know, what's it like to be a human being? What's it like to flow through the space? What's it like to sort of understand proportions? Um, so the residential arena grounds it and then everything comes from it. You know, what's so interesting that you say that is that Many times we see a lot of experimentation in the commercial work, right? Let's say like hospitality, well, all different times of commercial work, but we see that kind of risk being taken and then a different version of it might come around in residential, but you really experimented, found, found the right mm -hmm. kind of clients that would allow you to experiment almost reverse in the residential world. Totally, totally agree. And that was almost, I'd like to say it was a brilliant idea. <laughs> I think I just sort of fell into it. What I realized as a kid, because my background, you know, maybe I started into architecture a little late, even though I grew up in architecture, to just really be serious as a professional, I started a little late. I realized that I had to, if I wanted to really sort of realize a lot of these things, I had to work in an arena that went relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. So that, you, you know, because to your point, a commercial project might be uh, five to seven years. I, the, the Burke Museum is a 10 year project, you know? And somebody said to me, well, I bet you're looking forward to your next uh, museum, Burke Museum. I'm going, <laughs> well, I'm, running, I'm running out of time, you know? Yeah. But the residential arena and even the TI arena allows you to sort of think about that nano uh, level invention. Um, and then, uh, and rather quickly, you see the, the, the you know, you see the circle in, in uh, one or two years rather than five to 10 years. Does that make sense? And yeah, does that, no, I, no, that's compl that completely makes sense. And I think it's very, very true and valid by the way. But the fact that you were able to do it is a testament to your talent and your vision, honestly. Well, okay, so we wanna, have, we wanna show everybody some of, the, some of the projects that are in the book. And I, I love that with how it's broken up. So designing for human experience, adaptive reuse and architecture in nature, right? So, that, I mean, they couldn't be more relevant. They've always been mm -hmm. relevant, but like right now it just pulls at your oh, heart yeah. how relevant they are. Um, what, I guess we should start with the cover of the book, which is, mm -hmm. which is in the <clears throat> chapter, Designing for Human Experience, and that's the Martins Lane Winery, right? So Martin's Lane is actually a project for a client that I've been working with for probably now, I don't know, I'd have to do the math, probably 15 or 20 years. I mean, he's been an amazing supporter uh, and hired me uh, for a number of projects that were really deeply meaningful, not only working for him, but also for the group up there and in that landscape. Now, uh, the Spokane landscape is very similar to the Okanagan, Canadian Okanagan landscape. So when I went up here the first time 15, 20 years ago, 
I was, well, in fact, I was home. We almost moved to Penticton as, oh, yeah. as, as kids. Oh, yeah. Um, my parents had come from Switzerland, so they basically could live anywhere, and they <clears throat> landed in Spokane. But we had a lot, most of our friends were up in Cranbrook and Penticton. The, uh, the reason I'm super happy with that cover, Cindy, let's see if this makes sense to you. And I actually, I had people push back on me that it was not a residential project. It was not a, a, a building that you could see. And I said, that's the that's point. It. That's, that's it. That's exact. The yeah. point is that this, this, this winery, which is wine is all about the, the ground, the terroir. Yeah. It's all about what's happening in the ground. The idea is that this building sort of like whispers into the background, into the landscape, and it becomes part of the landscape. It's the same angle as the uh, the slopes of the vineyards beyond, and even the in, even the hills. So it's second glance. It's a hopefully, hopefully, it's a second glance uh, cover. It's almost like working title. It almost disappears if you right. you look at it at a certain angle. It kind of flashes a little bit, and then you look at it, it almost disappears. It's the idea with the my architecture, at least. I'm not going to, I've said it a million times, I'm not going to design anything more beautiful than nature. Everything about nature is the inspiration. So it's already, I'm already interpreting that. If there's a way to make that, you know, architecture just feel like it's part of the, part of the nature of nature. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally does. And um, a, a, a few thoughts about that is that, you know, first of all, being part of the landscape is what we talk about all the exactly. time. You've just proved exactly. it with that cover. It's a stunning cover, but it's also it's also mysterious and it makes you want to open the book, which I think is part of, you know. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully when you open the book, you like what's inside. But, you absolutely, but there's, no question, <laughs> there's no question about that. I do like how you talk about the, the landscape in, you sort of frame it like it's almost like wine pouring. It was so beautiful. Mm. Yeah, well, be, yeah, because it's basic. Well, it, it, there's a whole sort of chapter basically about the way that wine is made and, and you know, mm. in a gravity sort of situation and the way the building is assembled to sort of get as much daylighting. It's, it's kind of like you take the box and you do this if you look at it closely. So then all of a sudden you get daylighting in the center of the box. You follow the, the land. You it, Anyway, it's it really I. I I look back on that project, and, and for me, Cindy, it's a project that fell together. It's almost as if in, I, I had sort of um, worked, my, worked for all these years, and then all of a sudden there was, a, there was a, a functional solution that became a poetic solution, if that makes sense. And it was Anthony that basically um, uh, hired me to, to make that moment. So as usual, the clients are the most important part of any of our projects because in fact if it wasn't for a client we wouldn't have that opportunity absolutely and and you had done um this is your second winery for them as right yeah this is this is second and uh oh no this is well yeah it, you're right it, really second significant one now we're working on a third and fourth uh, uh with and we're doing his home on uh, on the lake so not uh, bad it, <laughs> no, it's it's fantastic because again, it's a landscape that I know well, um, and it's a a place that I just love. Wonderful, that's beautiful. Okay, so another theme um, in the human experience is the Burke Museum, and that's mm -hmm. right in Seattle, and that's really mm -hmm. a special project. And I love there was something about like breaking down the barriers between the public mm -hmm. and the back of and the back of house. Tell us about it. Well, that was Julie Stein's agenda, and uh, I, of course, agreed a uh, hundred percent with her, with her agenda. Because, in fact, my background is about looking in the background. Remember, we talked about sculptures. I actually like the way sculptures are being made almost more than when they're when they're finished or or a building the when it's being constructed. So that's what Julie is really uh, saying about um, about the Burke is that it's not just about the exhibits out in front. In fact, the exhibits are finding the culmination of a bunch of work. Right. But in fact, maybe for kids, the most inspirational part, especially for kids, the most inspirational part is actually how it's done. How you take these mysteries of nature and you sort of assemble them, or, or well, you reassemble them, or you sort of collect them and begin to understand them. That's what a scientist does. So that story is the basis for the Burke to 
break down that barrier between what is happening behind the screen and uh, and how it affects what's happening in front of the screen. So the whole, I call it the Swiss cheese scheme, <laughs> which is basically a whole bunch of holes to sort of look inside. And the reason it's a Swiss cheese scheme, if this makes sense, is that also collections are about protection, right? You have, these are fragile materials. There's DNA material. Uh, well, it's all DNA. A lot of it is DNA material, but there's also, um, there's also skin, there's fur, there's um, um, uh, works on paper, there's, you know, works on bark. There's a whole bunch of really uh, environmentally fragile things that are intended to be collected and studied. So you have to be sort of strategic about how you open into behind the closet, you know, behind the, behind the uh, door, the storage right. door, and then um, how you close it off also. Yeah, you know, uh, as uh, you know, I think of, I also think of you as architects and designers, but also as an editor, we're always trying to make things look beautiful, right? And, yeah. and sometimes behind isn't as pretty, but that's, that's the interesting part, right? That's exactly right. I like the not pretty part because yeah. it's sort of, it means it's moving. It means right. there's something, there's something mysterious. There's something uh, that's changing. When we went to the back of the house, uh, before we started on the design, uh, we went to the back of the house. I saw all these like uh, uh, First Nation canoes and and uh, 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 bones and stuff like that, just kind of stuck on, on it, shelves. And yeah. I said, "Oh my God, this is this is where the magic is." Yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. It's a beautiful project. Um, I was really excited uh, to go through the images of that. You got to go visit. Okay, I'm going to you know, visit proof, you and go see it. Yeah, proof, proof, as as you know, architecture proofs in the pudding. It's the real thing. It's it really That's you true. have to show up and experience That's it. That's true. You're going to show up. All right. So next theme is adaptive reuse, and I I mm. love that we're going to over over on the East Coast in my hometown over in New York, and frankly, Long Island City. Mm -hmm. Sort of an unlikely project, but. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's called Mr. Steam, but it's so interesting that they had the building since the 60s. It's kind of amazing, right? Yeah, you know, uh, this whole re adaptive reuse um, situation, I think, and I've been saying that in my last quarter of my career, I'm seeing that as like a super important part of, of that uh, last quarter. And uh, honestly, Cindy, it's because there's so much stuff out there yeah. that is either underused or not used or thrown away because it's not used. And then yet we're building new things next to it. Um, can't we go back in like a hot rod and kind of gain that, uh, well, maybe patina, but also that history, you know, of the people that built it, the people that designed it, the people that lived in it. I think that's uh, like soul. That's like a soul of a building. And Mr. Steam is a perfect example of that. You know, maybe most people might say it's not a particularly attractive uh, building, whatever that means, because I don't know what that means. Right. Um, uh, you know, in, in the book, I talk in my, um, uh, in my um, uh, Distinguished Whatever Alumni <laughs> Award speech, I talk about a professor that taught me something about um, assumption of what is ugly and what is not ugly. And it was really a fascinating exercise. I hope people read it because I just really think it was a turning point for me. And from that point on, I understood that nothing was really ugly, that everything had some worth, and that you, if you go into it like an explorer, like a mountain climber sort of, and you assemble something out of this existing situation, man, you can get some, you can get some fantastic uh, uh, results that you wouldn't necessarily get in a ground up building. Right, and, right. or the, co uh, like the columns, for instance, which are glorious. Exactly. They're fantastic. The other thing is, it's the most sustainable way of, uh, of doing a building because the embodied energy is already there. No matter how hard you try to make a perfect new building sustainable, it's not the same as making an old building uh, with, good, with good systems. Um, into a into a good building, into a sustainable building. So, right. like I think it's our future. I yeah, think I, I, really. You're like an explorer, you know. And oh, the yeah. building, And when you walk into that project, first of all, it's a great testament to this company too that's been around for such a long time, um, because working with you just like elevated everything. Honestly, 
and just seeing how beautiful, as you say, what's ugly, yeah. what's not, uh, like it doesn't really matter. You see that you've sort of stripped it back and found the beauty um, and yeah. the function, obviously. Yeah, and, and you're right, and you're making a good point about something. The only reason that happened was because of the client. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody else, uh, it, you know, the client came to me and said, hey, I'm interested in what you've done because of whatever. And it was clearly, you know, some of this sort of maybe industrial aesthetic or sort of this um, this uh, uh, agenda on my part to always uh, uh, look at the nat natural nature of the thing and, yeah. and, and embrace that. And for some reason, this client in Long Island City <laughs> called me in Seattle oh. and said, I love your stuff. Come out here and do it. Are you interested? It's a small project. Are you even remotely interested in it? I go, of course I am. This is like a perfect was, project. I know. I just thought that was like so wonderful. And it felt, it felt very uh, random in a way. Like he couldn't believe that you wanted to either. And it's fantastic. Yeah. The result is, is fantastic. OK, yeah. so let's get to our third theme which is architecture and nature, which is what you talk about all mm. the time. And there are some famous, famous Kundig houses in this chapter, like, like the Rio house um, that everyone's seen in Brazil, that's splendid. But the dragonfly one in Montana, I don't know that everyone knows about this project. Yeah, it's, um, so it, it almost fits in, dragonfly almost fits into the um, agenda of the cover in a way is, is how do you respond, and, and so does Rio in a way, all, all the projects do. How do you respond to the, the local natural context? I grew up in a natural context. I grew up in Spokane, Northern Idaho, you know, uh, well, it's Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho, Southern British Columbia. That landscape is so big that as a kid, you can't help but to be somewhat uh, intimidated. Not intimidated is not quite the word, word, but you sort of recognize that nature is a lot bigger than 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 we are so how you know in, in sort of a reverence how do you sort of back away from trying to impose something on nature but actually sort of blend in with nature dragonfly was very much that if you look at the project you'll see that the colors the proportions the way it floats through the forest the mixed stand forest of uh, of uh, uh, Whitefish, Montana, the way it um, picks up the horizon line and the lake line, you know, the water line as it floats through that forest, you know, and again, all the sort of columns and colors of the bark yes. um, and the shadows in the bark. It's intended to sort of, again, be a whisper into that, into that uh, landscape. Um, and, uh, and then it also kind of opens and closes. You know, this was a client that very much is active outdoors, like, like me, I'd rather be outside than inside. This, that's the way this client also, also was. So it actually, the house in a sense kind of can undress, you know, we, it can kind of open up big windows and big doors and kind of just breathe that, that natural landscape of, um, of uh, Western Montana. And then it also um, can close up because Montana is a true four season um, climate and there's an ability to then take this you know put the clothes back on and kind of cozy up and become a little more intimate so that's the idea of uh, well it's one of the ideas of dragonfly how it opens and is in, uh, influenced by the nature of its place yeah it's it's wonderful and the way you do that so seamlessly so beautifully um like nobody else honestly tom we can't forget the costa rica house too that everyone has seen that also is like part of the landscape that is just wow right yeah well and of course that's a that's a different climate slightly right, different totally. climate that's a climate where you're in flip flops and shorts and a exactly. t-shirt and you're 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 hanging out things that the breezes are going up and down the surf's up you're going down to the beach Right. So the idea of that place is it is in a semi-tropic, you know, totally comfortable place. Interesting thing about that project is that most of the wood was harvested um, out of uh, the local forest because it was an invasive species, and that is teak. It was not a, well, not a particularly high grade um, teak, but uh, teak in Costa Rica in this area is invasive. So uh, you can take it out of the forest for, for nothing, uh, basically. Well, it costs something to take it out, but... Um, and then um, assemble a, a home in it. And so that was a dream project, frankly. Again, because it's almost like you're outside when you're inside. Right, and, and also just like you said, like exploring um, nature in all different settings, right? That's what you're a master mm -hmm. of, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, 
and well, I love I love nature, whatever that wherever it is. If it's up in Alaska, if it's down in Costa Rica, if it's over in Korea, if it's in in Switzerland, it doesn't matter. Austria or yeah, well, Austria. I'm doing something up in the mountains of Austria. Doing something. I finished something in Australia and New Zealand. Man, what a what an honor to be able to engage our uh, globe in a sense, culturally and environmentally. It's it's been fantastic. Yeah, well, you're you're definitely um, somebody that uh, you know. I, I say this to to students a lot because I say find an idol, find an idol that you can follow. And when I see a book like this, I say like, if you love Tom, you got to get the book and dig in because it's personal to him. Like you're gonna see him all over this book, and you can really really understand the process and as you say, uh, the working title. So kind of. What's what's deeper behind all these projects? And I'm excited. I want my signed copy, Tom. <laughs> uh, I think it's in the mail. Oh, Sydney. good. <laughs> <laughs> I heard I that one before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we all have. Yeah. Right. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'll definitely get your signed copy. <laughs> well, listen. I want to thank you for uh, getting up in the wee hours for this for this conversation, mm -hmm. and I'm sending you. A big virtual hug. Congratulations on all your success. Please, please uh, keep sharing it. We need it. We need leaders yeah. like you. And um, I'm very excited to really dig into every word in the book. Fantastic. Thanks again, Cindy. Okay. Sending my love. Say hi to Jim, too. Say hi to Jim. Will do. Okay. Will do. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Cindy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.